now. So again, please use the Q&A button if you have any questions and we hope you enjoy the event. Over to you, Keith. Thanks, Karen. So we appreciate that uh, many of you have different levels of experience with digital automation. So after the introductions, we're gonna spend about 10 minutes just to go through uh, and ensure we all have the same basic understanding. And then we're gonna discuss uh, four real projects. These are, these are uh, real life uh, 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 challenges that, that we helped uh, both local councils and healthcare to, to resolve. And then we're gonna close off our demonstration our session with a demonstration that shows how the uh, various digital automation technologies can work to, together to deliver real and tangible benefits. Um, and as Karen said, we've reserved plenty of time for Q&A. So on the call, you've got Karen, who has been facilitating for us. Myself, Keith, I'll be doing uh, going through the bulk of the slides. Uh, Marco, who will be presenting the uh, live demo. And uh, Paul, who will be available for any questions we have, particularly commercial questions at the end. Um, just as, uh, to kind of set the scene, uh, for those of you who don't know us, we are T-Impact. Uh, we're digital transformation specialists. We've been doing this for about 15 years. Uh, we've worked with some of the biggest firms in the world, such as you know HSBC, the biggest uh, bank by market capitalization, NHS, the third largest employer in the world, right after the Chinese Army and McDonald's. We, um, uh, we've worked with uh, six local councils and continue to work with six lo local councils here in the UK and, and a few organizations within the NHS. Um, what we do as, an, uh, as a firm is we, we focus on two things and we're proud that we do these two things very well and we don't really, uh, uh, customers that ask us to do other things, we politely decline. We try and stay very focused um, uh, uh, on, on the things that we do and the things we know we can deliver value. And that's we improve customer journeys. We will uh, baseline and model what's happening today, identifying areas for improvement to take waste and defects out of your business processes, your patient pathway, your customer journey, your value stream, whichever term you like. And then with some of our customers, we go on then to automate. Um, and we use a number of uh, technologies for automation. The technologies that we've chosen are technologies that complement the the, the tech that you have already. So you don't have to rip out or replace your CRM system or your, or your housing system or your patient care system in order to, to uh, deliver new features and build capability on what you have. Uh, the technology we use is primarily around chatbots, software robots, which is commonly called robotic process automation, artificial intelligence and workflow. And we'll talk about those a bit later. Probably our flagship project is the work we've done with NHSBT. We're really proud of this. Um, every organ trans transplant that happens across the UK, it's a software we built in collaboration with NHSBT that matches that organ and offers that organ out. Um, and when you consider that, consider that we, you know, uh, how many people's lives depend on organ transplants and, and that people die on the waiting list every year, it, it, it honestly is our most precious a commodity in the in the UK. So it's quite important, life critical, heavily regulated industry. And the solution runs 24-7, 365 days a, days a year. Um, we wanted to start off by um, uh, addressing a topic that we get asked quite often when working with our customers uh, is how to create capacity for their transformation programs. So the challenge that many of our customers are telling us about is they, they realize that their organization isn't perfect and they, they're, they're going through a reorganization to realign their either their, their organization and their structure or more broadly their entire operating model to try and give better service to their residents and patients. They know that they've got numerous touch points and those aren't always uh, uh, controlled in the best way and don't always use the best tools and that their IT systems don't align very well to their business processes. And those processes are full of waste and defects and they're creating lots of failure demand. Customers calling back to check if something was done because they don't trust that it, because it's not always done consistently or when something's done wrong and, they, and, and they're, they're, they're creating more workforce uh, uh, by, by uh, uh, having to fix it further downstream. And as a result, staff are spending too much time on low level work. They're really piecing together this jigsaw puzzle of IT systems and broken processes. 
So, so this is recognized, you know, we, we, lots of our customers are very clever. They, they know this is a problem, but, but it's a real challenge to free staff because they're so busy in this day-to-day uh, -day work that you just can't get them off that urgent activity, you know, the firefighting and the, and the BAU work to actually participate in more important projects to make things better. And that's, uh, that's made even more difficult by difficulties to backfill. So there's, there's budget limits at the, at, at the moment, funding is tough. Recruitment has become more of a challenge since Brexit. Um, uh, one of my team recently went out and had a look and saw that there were uh, something in the order of 200,000 open positions across, uh, across the UK for, for a single role at the moment. So when, they're, when our customers are looking at reorganizing their service, and some of our customers have 700, 750 different services that they offer, they tend to uh, uh, categorize those into simple services or services that need some assistance or, or complex services. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, sim the complex services are services that cross multi uh, multiple, require multiple services to deliver the, 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 the outputs that the patients or residents require, sometimes require multiple agencies. Um, the assisted services, uh, sometimes, you know, the they, they, uh, customers need a bit of help to even understand or to request the services in a, in a, in a correct way. Um, so as, as more and more agencies are getting integrated, we're seeing there's a higher demand for our most experienced staff for the complex services. There is potential to automate in the, in the assisted services, but because they're more complex, it's, it's seldom a quick win. So what we see the real uh, opportunity is um, implementing digital quick wins in the simple services where a, a request is made by a customer and that, that request can be delivered uh, without, uh, using, uh, the, uh, without using existing staff capacity and without changing existing IT systems. So when you look at the, at the marketing uh, information online, um, the vendors are, are quite often talking about the full potential of their products. And of course, uh, a chatbot or a robot or an AI module could do anything. You can build whatever you want with it, uh, but you're going to be customizing it pretty heavily to do that. So one of the things we, we wanted to do is just get us all on a level playing field here and just a bit of plain speaking about what these things, are, things do. So chatbots are great for speaking, robots are great for acting, and AI is great for decisions. When you boil it down to it, that's what you really want to use these apps for. So when you think about chatbots, they quite often pay for themselves very quickly by dealing with the kind of uh, calls that your call center just doesn't need to deal with. Your frequently asked questions, um, uh, uh, there's, there's a number of things that can be deflected without requiring any integration into other systems. Um, the chatbots can support your, your support 40 different languages, voice, traditional web chat, as well as chat over social media, such as Facebook, um, uh, 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 sorry, <laughs> Facebook, LinkedIn, and, and increasingly with Teams as well. And the better products are, are carry on a very human-like conversation. They moved on quite a bit over the last five or 10 years from the clunky uh, 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 chatbots that we used to have. And, and they can allow seamless handover to an agent. So you could start a conversation with a chatbot, be handed over to an agent. And once we, we've resolved maybe some uncertainty the chatbot couldn't deal with, can actually hand back to, the, to another chatbot to finish off the transaction. So chatbots could also uh, determine what services are required and could potentially uh, uh, get information from your IT systems to provide real-time information or fulfill those services. But in order to do that, you'll be building integration through your housing system, your revenue and bend, your patient management system. Um, and and these, these interfaces always take longer and cost more than, than are anticipated. And they also require changes to your, your, your off-the-shelf packages that you're using, which means that they're more expensive to maintain as, as you upgrade them. So a better option is sometimes to use a robot where a chatbot can understand by speaking to a human what it is that they're actually after, can uh, issue the commands across to the robot, and the robot can go and use the IT system the same as your staff would. So robots automate uh, uh, work that's normally provided by humans, and, and they're really good at doing that basic fulfillment work, particularly for those simple processes. They retrieve and update data from your existing IT systems. They don't require any integration. 
And if, and if your vendor knows what they're doing, they'll also be collecting insight into the process. So after your robot goes live, you're collecting more and more process insight so that you can increase the number of transactions that they can deal with. Um, we hear something in the news about artificial intelligence every day and, it, and, it, and it's uh, moving forward at uh, unprecedented speeds. Uh, they estimate that, 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 uh, that an artificial brain will be as intelligent as a human brain by 2025. So pretty scary stuff. But when you think about artificial intelligence, it really, you know, it really comes down to two basic categories. One is a, a general purpose AI that's really machine, machine learning. And that's where you've got a, a, some, some a data scientists and developers spending quite a bit of time trawling through data and cleansing data to, uh, to use historical trends to try and predict outcomes. We're talking about the other, you know, not the, not the general use, the more uh, specific use of, of AI. And a lot of these services have been prepackaged and published by vendors like Microsoft and Amazon Web Services and IBM and, and Google. And these, uh, these services are available on the cloud and can be integrated into your customer journey, literally in a matter of, in a matter of hours. Um, so where AI is really useful is for dealing with unstructured uh, data, um, where uh, images, handwriting, interpreting the, uh, what the intention and content of emails are as well as the pattern matching of more advanced machine language. But if you were to build your solution on AI, you need to get the data from your customer transaction over to the AI platform. Once it makes a decision, you have to do something with it. So you have to get it back into one of your control systems, say your housing system or, or your social care system. And then you have to change the behavior of your staff so they do something different to support your customer. So that would again mean building lots of interfaces, so uh, the, the, the shortcut through that is integrating AI into your process by using RPA. So with that in mind, if we just think about the way that um, uh, work has been done traditionally in organizations, uh, customers send their request in via traditional uh, interfaces, call centers, off, walk into the office before COVID, uh, send, a, send a letter through the post or through a digital inter interface, you know, the, the website, social media, what have you. And, and then all the fulfillment work has been done by staff. Those staff deal with a number of IT systems and in the typical council, there'll be hundreds of IT systems that they're, they're working with for very specialized needs. Those IT systems are traditionally very functionally oriented. So you have what, you know, like a North gate for revenue and bins or a Civica for housing or orchard. Um, you might have a liquid logic for social care uh, uh, system one or, or EMS for, for uh, patient records, uh, core, core GP record system. So all, all of these systems are, are providing a, a great function, but it's not very well aligned to the business process. It's really well aligned to the functional departments, which historically have purchased them. What we can do today is we can overlay that with chatbots, robots, and artificial intelligence that allows us to replace some of the work that humans do today Freeing them up for transformation projects, digital inclusion, and, and higher value activities. Um, this, this was traditionally seen as a threat to, to employment, but we're, we're, ent we're entering a phase in, 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 in our society where there just aren't enough humans to do the job, and there aren't enough humans with the skills to do the job. So we're, we're seeing you know, acute staff shortages in some places. We're, we're really facing a, a scenario where we're not going to have any choice but to automate some of these activities and free people up for uh, more interesting work. When we speak to our customers, the, the benefits they're looking for for digital automation fall into five categories. They want to improve customer service and being able to extend the hours without having to make people work shifts um, and, and personalize the service they, they deliver, including multiple languages. And they want those services to be customer driven, you know, aligned to what the customers are asking for, not a series of, uh, of stage gates across functional silos. They want to save. They want to protect the services that they offer by reducing the operating costs. They don't want to have to cut off services to residents because it's, it's important to them. They want to centralize common tasks that, that cross different service lines and, and improve quality to eliminate failure demand. Um, increasingly, we're seeing demands for real-time service, 
um, industryanalyst.ec has estimated that um, up to 24% of the uh, government services will be uh, delivered in real time by 2023. And we want to increase intelligence. We want to cleanse the data that's going into our systems and be able to do something with it. Right now, we've got loads and loads of dirty data locked up in hundreds of IT systems, very different, difficult to correlate. Our data warehousing solutions and our business intelligence solutions are only as good as the underlying data that they pull from. So even with the best dashboards in the, in, in the world, you need clean data to actually control that. So one of the key things that a, a number of our customers are asked us for is to, is to help them improve the quality of the data as it goes, as it's being captured. And of course, what we're talking about, the, the gist of today's session, creating capacity. So enabling you to run those transformation projects, enabling you to offer digital inclusion for you know, people that just aren't able or, or just aren't comfortable working, uh, uh, contacting you via digital channels. So with that uh, scene setting and hopefully it's all on the same page, we'll uh, talk about, want to talk to you about some of the projects that, that we've delivered and uh, what, they, what they actually, the real results of the, that came out of it. Um, so uh, this diagram just highlights a few of the pro challenges that we've, we've addressed for councils and healthcare organizations. Uh, we, we hope that it'll help you to imagine what could be possible in your own organization. The key thing that to take away from this is these things are fast, usually delivered in four to eight weeks. So we're not talking about months and years of work to get new features out the door and to deliver capability. Um, and, and they're low disruption. So you know we've been fine tuning our approach over years and there's lots of other good vendors out there that do a similar thing to us. Well, we, we require an absolute minimum capacity from your staff. So these can be delivered in parallel with their day jobs. And, and we're not taking them out for workshops, you know, days at a time. It's a few hours here, a few hours there, and then we can deliver the solution ready for, for acceptance testing. So there's four um, uh, 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 real business case I wanted, I wanted to go through with you. Um, the first one's direct debits. Um, this was a project we delivered for London Council. Um, they've done uh, some really good work in getting their direct debits. Uh, people sign up for direct debits. We all know that that makes payment processing much easier. Um, they had people signing up for direct debits directly on a self-help portal, and they were doing it over the website. The problem is that they were getting thousands of exceptions coming up where they, the direct debit uh, uh, data that they, they entered could be matched up to their revenue and benefit system. In this case, it was Academy. So these thousands of transactions um, needed a human to go in and, and understand why, why was it rejected, what needed to, 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 uh, what needed to change. Um, there were any number of reasons why these things were, were rejected and we had to work through uh, and, and unpick that and, and define the business rules for each so that we could automate it. But one of the key reasons was uh, people don't have a forename and surname. Some people have three names, some people have five. I have three, I'm Robert Key Stagner. My mother chose to call me by my middle name. So some systems call me Key Stagners, some call me Robert Stagner. Quite often they type it in wrong and I'm Robert Stranger. But there's, no, there's no telling what some call center agent typed in and, and when, when entering my name into the system. So it's a bit of a guessing game when I'm submitting an application or I'm following up. Uh, whether I put it into a portal and, and, and something got rejected and I, and I had to put it in a different way or whether somebody, somebody typed it in. So what we did uh, uh, for a solution in this case is we built, uh, uh, sorry, the solution that we, bu we built to resolve this um, uh, went through and uh, 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 applied to business rules across the types of exceptions that occurred and represented the data, the data across. Um, what we would do as far as names, which was one that was happening most often, is we built a, we designed a bit of fuzzy logic where we would use combinations of data to ensure that we had an exact match. And we went through a series of, of checks with different combinations of data until we could find the one that matched. So the first implementation uh, uh, delivered over 70% of the, or, or uh, we were able to automate over 70% of the transactions. Um, but we use the data that came, the process insight that we gathered from that solution, and we went back and we enhanced it. Then we got up to, I think it was 83% in the, in the next major release, 
And uh, finally, we, we're now over 90% of the transactions are being delivered. So this means that 90% of the work that used to require uh, uh, human labor and you know tedious, uh, mind-numbing work trying to match data up between systems um, was, was being done automatically by, by our solution. Um, the next one I'd like to touch base on for you is um, rental increase. So we've, we've delivered this for a number of councils, including uh, Durham County Council and Hackney Council. Um, what happened well, when... Um, uh, landlords provide stock to uh, to councils to provide for social housing. Um, they they like to increase the increase the rent, increase the service charge. Some of those councils uh, limit how often they can do that. To and, and in some cases, they are only allowed to do it annually. And when that occurs, there's a there's a there's a huge peak of work where you know all of the landlords are sending those through. Sometimes tens of thousands of requests to increase housing prices. So the uh, because it's something that doesn't happen that often, um, the council has to bring in agency staff and redeploy uh, uh, council workers from other tasks to, to deal with the demand, because it's quite important that they process this within a reasonable period of time, um, because they need to get their, their revenue bins and finance systems updated, because it's, it's a reasonably chunky bit of cost that they've got with, a, with these rental increases, and they're making other investment decisions. They need to to make those decisions accurately, they, they need to know how much more they're gonna be spending on housing. Um, and, and as you can imagine, agency workers coming in, never done this before, or council workers not having done it for, for over 12 months, they're doing, they're, they're working through the process for the, for the first time. They tend to make mistakes. So there was an overhead with quality assurance and checking the work to make sure it was done accurately. So what we designed was a solution that would automate this. It took uh, uh, all the emails coming into a dedicated email, which was already set up for, for uh, house price changes. Um, it would extract the spreadsheet, uh, sorry, extract the spreadsheets that, that were sent across because the councils required all landlords to submit in a, in a standard format. Um, it would try and open up that spreadsheet and if it was password protected, it would search the covering email and any subsequent emails to see if it could find the password. And if they couldn't find the password, it emailed back to the landlord to ask them to provide it. Once it had the passport, and it would continue emailing the landlord every few days until it got the, until it got those, uh, the password, so it would follow up. Uh, once it, got, it could access the spreadsheet, it would apply the rules that the council workers uh, would apply, but it, it would do it 100% consistently without uh, any deviation. Um, and it would then send a personalized uh, a letter back to the landlord to tell them whether or not it had been approved for each of the properties in the, the, in the spreadsheet. That's both for the rental increase and for the service increase. And if it was approved, that it would go and apply those changes to the red and bins and finance systems. So the net result of this is that we automated tens of thousands of rental increase. We'd, we uh, didn't need to bring agency staff in. So there was an immediate saving, a very fast return on investment uh, for this one. Uh, council staff didn't have to be redeployed from other tasks, which meant that they didn't build up a backlog of their normal work. So it was a lot less stress for them um, because needless to say, they'd be pulled in very high stress trying to work through these tens of thousands of applications and then go back to their day job, high stress because <laughs> there was a backlog of applications built up while they were doing that. The third one I'd like to touch on is uh, uh, slightly different. It's for environmental and community protection teams. Um, so these are the teams that go out and they deal with pest control, they deal with fly tipping, they deal with uh, uh, inappropriate behavior. They're the guys that deal, that issue the ASBOs. Uh, so this is a team that has a potential for generating revenue for the councils um, because they have chargeable services they can offer. In, in this case, the council had uh, uh, had been trying to recruit uh, an environmental uh, and protection uh, community protection officer for a number of years. Um, they they you know every time they recruited one, they 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 lost one, and they're really struggling to get a full complement of the of the team. So we had a look at the work that they were doing, and we identified that they they come up with a really clever uh, a solution for mobility because they were out in the field. They all had mobile phones. They would just take a picture of whatever they needed to, to apply, uh, whatever evidence they need to capture. They would attach it to an email and mail it back to the, to, to the head office. Um, so, you know, they had three quarters of a mobility solution up and running. 
Um, the challenge, the problem was there was some poor slot in the office that had to receive all those emails, uh, open them up, download those images, as well as deal with all the automated uh, emails that were coming from various IT systems and, and put all this into their, into their workflow. So we built a solution that would extract the uh, information that was, was sent back. Um, again, set up a dedicated email address. So images, automated emails from IT systems, other forms of content that was sent across. Um, it would then open up uh, index uh, information at work, the workflow system that they were using. It would index it so that it was easy to search on and easy to find, and then upload the content to information at work. Um, by automating that work, we were able to free up a little bit of time from a number of people, and that equated to, uh, to uh, a sufficient freed up time that they didn't have to fill that position. In fact, not only did they not have to fill that position, they were able to offer some of those revenue generating services, such as training and pest control, that they hadn't been able to offer for some time. The last one I want to share with you is a housing challenge. So um, when uh, the, the, the council had years ago uh, uh, taken uh, tens of thousands of paper documents related to tenancy agreements and, 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 and housing information and, and had those scanned onto microfish. They were then later uh, 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 translated from microfish onto PDF images but it was just a big pile of tens of thousands of scanned images. And when uh, uh, either a call center or housing agent was on the phone with a, with a resident who wanted to talk about inherited rights for his housing, um, they needed this information to know whether they were allowed uh, those rights or, or whether they weren't. Um, and it was very difficult to go search for these when they're on the phone with somebody who, who in some cases could be quite demanding and, and quite confrontational. So it was very stressful for the, for, for the agents. Um, they were bright, looking to bring in agency staff to deal with uh, these scanned images and start to uh, try and capture this, the, this data and start get it, getting it online, again, in, in their workflow system, uh, information at work. Um, but we, we proposed there was a better way. So we, we built, we leveraged the environment uh, protection robot that we built previously, and we built a, 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 another robot on top of it. And what this one did was read through the scanned images of all the housing data, pull out the key information that you need for indexing and a link to the original file. It would then send that over to the environment protection bot, which, would, uh, uh, which we enhanced to, uh, in addition to uh, indexing the environment protection, also index this housing information. So this eliminated the need to hire the agency's staff. It also eliminated some GDPR risk because there was information that, that was subject to sub, uh, that, that would have had to been reported to subject access requests, but was very difficult, excuse me, to search. And there was significant cost avoidance um, because the data was easy to access. So we, the benefits for this uh, were, were, were pretty good. This is about 55,000 in uh, 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 benefits that was identified for this particular project. So we saw an ROI in, in a little bit under two months time. So uh, I hope some of those real life challenges resonated and, and uh, are somewhat similar to some of the things that you're seeing on, on your sign. Um, we wanted to move on and, and, and show you how you could use a few of these technologies to together to support uh, not just the automation of the service fulfillment, but also to support multilingual and multicultural communities. So uh, we originally built this, uh, uh, this, this demonstration for Hounslow Council that was running a digital fair, um, and we presented it to 70 or 80 of their, of their employees. Um, we, we built on top of one of their digital strategy uh, uh, initiatives, um, and, and that was around somebody that had dementia. We'll call him Brendan. Um, he's got early stage dementia, um, and, and he's struggling to, to cope, but he wanted to stay in his house. It was very important for him to stay in his flat. So the council comes up with some very clever ideas to enable him to stay in his home. Um, and uh, uh, that, that, that's agreed, but his daughter's a bit concerned because she notices that his email, uh, sorry, his post 
um, is is got the wrong flat number, and she wants to change that so that she can redirect the the, the post to herself. Um, so she speaks to the council, and they uh, authorize her to uh, act on as as his guardian, and they give her a pen device that allows her to uh, to to perform that work. Um, so in in this scenario, she's going to sign into the website, and she's going to access a new digital service, and she's going to be asked to enter that pen. She'll already have been authorized when, when she signed in. So we know that she's Brendan daughter and we know who, what she what her credentials are, but we need to make sure that she still has the right to act as a guardian. Um, in this scenario, what we're going to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the flow that we're, we're gonna demonstrate is a, is a chat bot is gonna chat to Brendan Starter in, in natural language and try and understand what service it is she's required. And when it understands, it's gonna ask the robot to do some work, go away and verify a PIN number. Um, and once the PIN number has been validated, it's going to ask the robot to go away and look up the potential addresses associated with her postcode. And then once it returns the address, she'll be able to, to uh, select the correct address. And, uh, and once she's confirmed that, yes, she wants the, the address changed, the chatbot will ask the robot to make the change of address. And the robot will go into Northgate and Liquid Logic, a housing and a social care system to make those changes. And then finally, um, the chatbot will ask her if she wants some evidence to confirm that the changes have been made. And really, again, this is uh, uh, this is to uh, prevent failure demand, to prevent her calling in and checking later that the changes have actually been made. We want to proactively give her give her the evidence. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, uh, Marco, who will display his screen and uh, walk us through the live demo. Marco, you ready? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, can you see my screen? We can, yes, Martha. we can, yep. Excellent. So um, the demonstration uses two, two parts. On the left-hand side, as you see uh, mentioned here, um, I have a mobile phone emulator where I could use to access this service. And on the right hand side, you see a remote desktop of uh, where the, the robot um, agent, the robot uh, council officer is going to do the work. So I'm going to start the demonstration by opening a browser, for example, and that would uh, allow me to select the service I'll be I'll be going to uh, a team packed website where we have the demo. Obviously this could be uh, any um, sort of council website where this is uh, going to be hosted, uh, which opens the interface or it starts the chat box to start the work. Um, Mark, if I could just, uh, I'm sorry, Mark, if I could just add, uh, just wanted to yeah. emphasize what Marco's saying there. So what you're seeing on that uh, rectangle on the left side of your screen is Marco's mobile phone. So as he's typing on his mobile phone, it's projecting here on the screen. Okay. And in line with what Keith was saying, we have multiple uh, I mean, our options to run with multiple languages. Uh, currently in our, on our uh, chatbot, we, we can have English and Spanish. I'll carry on with English uh, just for, for my benefit. And as we said, um, the chatbot will start uh, with guiding me through the uh, options to select the service. Um, I will express what I want to do. Oh, Marco's typing there. I'll just point out that he's intentionally misspelling a few words. Uh, yes. Because it, what he wants to demonstrate is that the uh, chatbot is smart enough to, to understand his intent and to figure out what it is he's asking. So the chatbot's carrying on a communication, you know, in, in, in fairly common language, the way that, uh, that a human would. It's now asked for a PIN number. It's now you on the right hand side. You see these green boxes popping up. 
that's where the chat bot is speaking to the robot and saying, please go look that pin num number in our access control list and tell me if it's valid. And the robots come back and said, it isn't. Um, and then the chat bot is carrying on speaking to Brendan Starter, uh, explaining that she gave the wrong pin and given her the opportunity to get the right device. Again, it's looking up the pin code in the access control. Okay, then so the robot has found the pin, told the chatbot, and the chatbot's now moved on to the next stage of the service and is asking Brendan's daughter for the postcode. You can just see that green box pop up on the right. That's where we've looked up the postcode and the list of valid addresses, and we've returned a series of addresses. Marco's going to skim through those and choose one he likes. And then for compliance reasons, we're just going to confirm with Brennan's daughter that yes, you want to change this. So now I've got a, a, a confirmation in my compliance, a compliance record that I could use for reporting at a later date. This was absolutely uh, uh, selected by the customer. She did want to make this change. So once we have that confirmation, the chatbot turns control over the robot, lets it go ahead. So it's signed into Liquid Logic, and it's now going to look up Brendan Smith. Oh, sorry, Brendan Smith. I think we were in the intro. <laughs> Now that it's find, found him, it's going to go and start to make the change to his address. And you'll see that uh, the box turns yellow as it's making changes, as it's marching through. It's overriding all the data, and it's uh, cutting and pasting data from the address file. So it's basically taking a golden source of data and updating the, the, the IT system. So there's zero chance of a typo or data being put in the wrong data field. So now we've updated our social care system. Uh, we're moving on to the housing system. So we're going into Northgate and we're gonna once again, look up uh, Brandon's details and change the, change the address. We intentionally had the, uh, we designed the demo to update two IT systems, because one thing that we see happens time and time again, uh, uh, both to ourselves and when we go on and we do a uh, process observation on, on customer sites, is agents will do the first activity, but, but then forget to follow up on the second. There's just so many keystrokes that they have to deal with, and the systems are quite complex. Quite often, muscle memory takes over, and as soon as they finish one thing, they're, 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 they're off to the next call. In this instance, you can see the robot will never forget. The robot will never skip steps. It'll always update every IT system that needs to be updated, and it'll ensure that the exact same address is put in every single one, thus cleansing the data as, as it's entered. So Marco's moving ahead here. So uh, he's keeping the pace. Uh, the last thing we want to do is we're going to offer to Ms. Smith if she would like a record as evident, or if she'd like an email with evidence that we've actually made this change. And as I mentioned earlier, this is to avoid failure demand. Um, for me personally, when I call into a call center, quite often I'll call in an hour later, speak to a different call center agent, just to check that they did what they said they were gonna do, because you find that there's just so many mistakes. Um, and, 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 and it's just uh, uh, more often than not, it's what I found. So what we're doing is we're trying to avoid that second inbound call. We're trying to cut the cost for the, for the operating center uh, or the, the call center. We're going to proactively offer her a chance to get the evidence. So the chat bot is told the robot, go away, do some screen prints, and send it across to Ms. Smith. In this case, we don't have an email address for Ms. Smith. So what Marco did was set up a proxy. Um, and Marco, if you can just open up those screen images, we can, we can see that it's uh, come through. So it's captured a screen print directly from the system. Of course, we could provide the evidence in another format, which is a convenient way of showing it. Thanks for that, Marco. Yes, sir. Um, so in summary, what we've seen there today um, is that 
Sorry. Um, in summary, what we've seen is that the uh, the the chatbot communicated with the robot. It gave uh, small service commands across to the robot. The robot dealt with the IT system, so we didn't have to build any interfaces. The robot simply used the screens that existed already. In a real world, we probably wouldn't display the Northgate screen and the Liquid Logic screen. We displayed those uh, uh, so that you could see what was going on behind the scenes. Um, and then it made it, it ended up with the updates in the IT system, the same as if a, if a human had performed it. So this was all done with no integration. Um, it was uh, um, uh, provided in English, but we could have done it. We demonstrated Spanish and we could have demonstrated another 38 languages. Um, and, and it was done rel relatively quickly, could have been performed at any time of the day or night. So this could be running 24 hours a day. And it could be further personalized for Miss uh, for for Miss Smith if 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 we chose to do so. Um, the amount of labor savings for this most uh, uh, taking local councils is, is an example. They get about three hundred address changes per year. Comes up to about nine thousand pounds of uh, unloaded labor cost. So you know you're not going to break even with the labor savings, but where you're really going to make the the savings is in the failure demand. Um, so this is the cost of when uh, uh, an address is entered incorrectly and people don't get demands for payment, people don't get court summons, people don't get notifications of, the, of services that are available to them because it's being sent to the wrong address. And then the labor cost of correcting that when, the, when it gets returned, uh, 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 returned to sender or when um, uh, the, the court case has to be started over again because, because you know, the demand wasn't sent to the right address. So with that, I'll, I'll hand over to Karen who will take any questions that anybody has. Okay, thanks Keith. I um, hope you all found that really interesting. Uh, we do have um, a couple of questions that have come through. Uh, the first one is for you, Keith. Um, how do you identify the processes that could be improved with digital technologies? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and we get, you, you won't be surprised, we get, you ask that quite often. Uh, so there's, there's four factors that we generally consider. One, is it suitable for the technology? Not all problems are suitable for chatbots, robots, or AI. Um, so, so you really look to see if there's a good fit. It's a, it's a tool to deliver a certain uh, uh, a pattern of solution. And if it doesn't fit that pattern, you don't try and shoehorn it in. Uh, the second we look at is return on investment. How much is it going to cost? What are the benefits going to be delivered? Because what you're doing is actually mapping the process before you start to build the solution, you can fairly accurately predict the benefits both in labor savings, uh, increased revenue, um, and, and, and other categories of savings. Um, the third that we, we look at is uh, change appetite. There's no use trying to make a change in a department where they are already run off their feet and, and just uh, you won't be able to get any time from the, from the team to participate. They, they, so you really wanna be working with a team that at least has some availability uh, uh, to, to show you the process and, 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 and to test the solution before it goes live. And finally, we look at complexity. Um, you, can do, you, can, you can automate some pretty complex transactions, much more complex than what we've demonstrated here today. But in reality, you don't want to start with the most complex because no matter what you do, your first, uh, you, know, you need to think about change management across the firm and the first bit of technology rollout, everything that goes wrong is going to be blamed on the technology. People need a little while to kind of get comfortable with it and to adopt it. So you probably want to start off with some, some small or medium-sized projects um, and then build up to your, to your more complex projects after you've got a few case studies that you can point, a few success stories that you can point to. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, well, actually I've got two questions coming, but you can kind of, very similar. So, so to Keith, how do you cost a project? And then on to Paul after that, um, roughly the average costs of an automation program. So Keith, if you want to go first on how do you cost a project? Sure, sure. So um, uh, there, there is some variability in the in, in the cost, but it but it's not like it's uh, ten times cost for one versus versus another. Um, so so the cost range is is fairly you know, fairly limited. Um, but the way we we work to uh, cost out a project is we first understand what happens today. So we'll run an observation session. This is usually an hour or less. 
what we're looking for is what are the steps involved in the process? We want to understand uh, when everything goes well, what we call happy path. What are the steps that are actually taken? Um, uh, what's the input and outputs of those steps? What triggers it? And who performs the activity and what IT systems they use? Um, uh, so th that we usually do that remotely with a, with a Teams or Zoom session like we're on right now. Um, and we just watch while somebody performs a piece of work and we ask a few questions. Um, once we've mapped that out, then we want to understand the exceptions. Um, you, here's where you apply Pareto's law. So those exceptions, which uh, occur on probably 20% of the transactions, can take 80% of the time because they're the ones that are the more complicated. And what we don't want to do is just automate the happy path and leave all the exceptions. We want to try and automate as many of those as we can. And if we can't automate them, we want to at least recognize them and actively hand them over to a human to manage and to start capturing some, some insight. So once we've done that, we then know how many activities need to be performed. We, under, we, we can identify which of those can be automated with chatbots, robots, and AI. We can take that um, and derive from that the features that need to be developed. And then we give it to our development team to do an effort estimate across that. We've got a standardized delivery approach so that we ensure that we have standard documentation, uh, standard uh, uh, sprints and playbacks, and ensure that we are really focusing on usability and benefit realization from the very first sprint in, in, in delivery. Uh, we usually deliver three sprints. The first one build, builds the end-to-end -end solution. So to the end user, it looks like the solution is complete and ready to go live, but it, it's only happy path. The second sprint deals with the exceptions and the uh, an exception processing, uh, which usually is the bigger of the two sprints, I have to say. And then the third sprint, which is resolving any user acceptance uh, incidents that are, or any incidents were identified during user acceptance testing and, and where appropriate operational acceptance testing. So with our standard uh, 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 delivery plan, we know how much those kind of uh, typical overhead activities take with those list of features that we get from that observation session, we can very quickly put an effort estimate to that. And we're usually able to turn a, turn a quote around in about 24, 48 hours. So you're also, also being asked on, 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 on that, Keith, it's so you can be replaced by a robot. <laughs> so some of the activities you perform can be replaced by a robot. Um, some of the activities I perform could certainly be replaced by a robot. I'd love, I'd love to have the bandwidth to build some of that. Um, but in reality, we don't, we don't do just one job at one task in our, in, in our day job. You know, so if you, if you got somebody called Frank working for you and you replace one of the tasks that he does, he probably performs 20 or 30 tasks in the course of a month. So that's one of the fallacies that, are, that you know, there's been a lot of uh, 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 bad press about robots re replacing people. The truth is they are going to replace a lot of the tasks that we do today, just like electricity replaced a lot of the ta tasks that we do and, and uh, tractors replaced some of, the, some of the tasks that we do. But what that means is that we can do higher value tasks. Um, so what, it, what, we, what we expect is that, that this will free people up to do more valuable work um, and allow companies to achieve more, more with less. Um, and uh, a, a lot of the individual mundane tasks that really aren't very fulfilling, like cutting and pasting data in and out of IT systems will be automated and we'll all be doing more interesting things. Thank you. And, and over to you, Paul, um, about um, what the average costs for an automation program. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Karen. Uh, so first of all, um, great presentation and demonstration there, Keith and Marco. So um, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to quickly introduce myself again. Uh, my name is Paul Hunt. I'm the commercial manager for T-Impact. So I am responsible for sales and account management. So uh, great question. Um, so what is the average cost? And I can only really talk in averages. So first of all, let's talk about project costs. So now, depending on the size of the workflow, the professional services is likely to come out. It is quite a big banding. So it's going to be between sort of 10 to about 40,000 pounds. And that is going to be dependent on the size of the workflow. Now, along with that, you're going to need some support. And we estimate that the gain, the average is probably could be sitting around about 6,000 pounds. And the cloud infrastructure costing is likely to be about 2,000. Now, along with those project support costs, um, you're going to have the um, licensing costs as well. Now, for um, a chatbot and an RPA license, um, this is 
going to be for a chatbot and two robots. Um, and just before I give you the number, it's likely, so just to put this in context, um, the chatbot and the two robots, they could run four to six medium sized projects. Okay. Um, and that is going to cost around about 70 to 75K per year. And that's again, just want to reiterate that that's going to run you four to six medium sized projects. Okay. Now, what I will say as well, very quickly, is that if you've got any particular processes in mind and want to talk to me about anything in, uh, in Pacific, specifically, uh, please reach out to me after the webinar. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Paul. And uh, one final question that, that's coming through, unless any coming in the meantime, is for, is for you, Marco. So um, during your demo, you showed uh, robots running on cloud infrastructure. What cloud infrastructure is normally supported? Uh, yes, thank you, Karen. So all the major cloud infrastructure providers are supported uh, with this platform, uh, such as AWS, Azure, etc. Uh, with the addi additional uh, functionalities now that uh, these uh, cloud providers also allow with UiPath is that is to create cloud robot pools, meaning you can scale dynamically the robot workforce if you need so. Uh, but equally also all of these, um, the platform can run um, on either private clouds or on premise as well, if such is the need depending on uh, you know, security or data protection requirements. That's great. Okay, well, we have no further questions that have come in. So that, that just leaves me to say thank you very much for your time today, everybody that's joined. Really hope you found today's session informative and you'll be able to use the content to help you with your, your, you and your organization's digital transformation progress. We will be following up over the next couple of days with you and we'll also send you a copy of the recording and a copy of the slides. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.